At this time, it is the privilege of the chair to invite forward his good friend, Dr. David Meyer, president of the Michigan District, whose own district convention begins on Sunday. The chair first met Reverend Dr. David P. E. Meyer in an orientation meeting in 2009 when both were elected as district presidents. He is the youngest of two sons born to Dr. Walter A. Meyer Jr. and Leah M. Meyer. His grandfather was the sainted Walter A. Meyer, the Lutheran Hour founder. David was married to Patricia Kemmerling on June 19, 1980. Their marriage has been blessed with four children, Leah, Joel, James, and Hannah. Leah is married to Kyle DeWeese, and their marriage has been blessed with Beckett and Avery, Pastor and Pat Meyer's two grandchildren. Hannah was married to Garrett Wenzelberger in 2016, and I believe James was married to Shay just last month. Joel. Joel was married to Joel was married. I'm going to have to get a very out. eligible bachelor. But go ahead. I'll have to get after my research assistant. I'm sorry, sorry about that. President Meyer received his BA from Concordia University, Ann Arbor, with a double major in biblical languages and Christian doctrine. Attending Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, he served his vicarage year at the West Portal Lutheran Church in San Francisco, California in 1980. After his ordination on August 15, 1982, he served as mission pastor of Our Savior in Marlette, Michigan, and then as youth pastor and interim head pastor at St. Peter in Arlington Heights, Illinois. In 1989, he was called to Our Savior in Lansing, Michigan as an administrative senior pastor. During his tenure, the congregation and school moved to a brand new facility on a 30-acre campus. He served there until he was elected president of the Michigan District Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, in June of 2019. During the 2012 and 2015 district conventions, he was re-elected. President Meyer has been a frequent speaker at youth retreats and men's gathering. He has served numerous times as dean at Camp Arcadia in Michigan. He's also served as the Michigan, in the Michigan district as a circuit visitor and as a vice president. President Meyer has a distinguished record of service to our Senate and was recently elected by his peers to serve as the chairman of the Council of Presidents, and that, my friends, is a high honor indeed. In 2007, Pastor Meyer was awarded his first honorary doctorate by St. Peter's Confessional Lutheran Church of South Africa. He was presented with the Outstanding Alumnus Award in May 2010 at Concordia University, Ann Arbor, during the commencement exercises, where he's also the commencement speaker. In the spring of 2012, Concordia University Ann Arbor awarded him the Doctorate of Laws degree in recognition of a lifetime of outstanding leadership and diligent labor in the Lord's Kingdom. In December 2012, Concordia University Wisconsin conferred the honorary degree of Doctor of Divinity to Meyer. He is a humbled sinner and a cancer survivor, forgiven and healed at the foot of the cross continually awed by the love of a gracious Savior. President Meyer looks forward to leading, to the leading and direction of our Lord Jesus as he continues in his service. It's his firm conviction to share his joy in knowing Jesus as Savior and Lord and the gospel as the power of God unto salvation for all people. Please welcome Dr., 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 Dr. Do you have one of those to spare? Uh, Dr. <laughs> Meyer... A man who is deeply admired by many as he leads us in God's word. Now, after that build-up, Dave, it better be good. So. There you go. No kidding. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for the privilege and opportunity of being with you during this year convention. Happy anniversary to all of you, and I know that God has used you in the past. I know that he will continue to use you mightily in the future because of who he is and his faithfulness. I also want to say to uh, Greg, congratulations on your re-election. I would, I would love to say I look forward to spending the next three years working with you, uh, but my election, hopefully, we'll see what happens on Monday. Please keep that in your prayers. I, Edith, congratulations to you also, and uh, we look forward to the, the years that we have yet in front of us. Vice President Chris Eskin, thank you so much for the word of God this day. It's always good to be with you and to hear you. The Lord continue to bless you richly. And I have a good friend here also that's up front. Uh, you will be hearing from him later, uh, President Dale Meyer. Great friend, great preacher, great theologian, and someday he'll learn how to spell. <laughs> Friends, 
You are an awesome people of God. And this is what I want to say to you, and I'm looking forward to your response. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. What a difference a day makes. What a difference a day makes with Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what happens to the disciples as well. I'm very thankful for your conference theme, Chosen with Purpose Abiding in Jesus. And tonight we're going to be looking at abiding in Jesus ever so briefly. I would like to call attention, I'm certain that all of you are Bible-carrying Lutherans, to John 15, perhaps on your phone somewhere else. Verses 4 and 5, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm still traumatized by my fifth grade year in grade school when I can remember the teacher building up to a fact that we were going to be having a test. We knew it was going to be taking place that week. We were kind of excited about it. I was very nervous about it. And then she told us what the instructions were. The instructions were to, as she put down this packet in front of us, read through the entire test. And once you have read through it, then come back to the beginning Well, you know what I did. I paged through it. I even kind of looked at the last page, the very last words. Nothing tricky there. So I shot back to the front page, and I worked feverishly. But of course, the last instruction on the test was this, somewhere on the last page. This is not a written test. This instrument is used to help determine how closely you follow directions. Doggone Lois, she always got things like that right. I'll tell you what, that began the lifelong confusion for myself, and I don't doubt for many, of equating activity with productivity. There are those who feel that they must continually, constantly to be laboring in the Lord in order to meet God's high standards. Now, to one set of eyes, that's very true, but there's also another result. There are many who are constantly, constantly busy, and there are still others that look at them and feel bad that they're not that busy, and they wonder why even try. Jesus gives us a totally different picture in the words that we're looking at this evening. Please remember the context as Pastor Eskett shared that with you. This is Monday, Thursday evening. Jesus is caring for his disciples. He loved them, the Bible says, John says, and he loved them to the very end. He washed their feet. He tried to prepare them. And this is where he shares these words, abide in me. They are going to panic. It won't be until three days later that they will hear the Lord's words as he looks each of them in their eyes and says, peace be with you. But right now, the pall of death is present. And Jesus wants to help his disciples get through everything that they're going to be facing. And so he says, abide in or abide with me. It's a great theme for your convention. It was something that was near and dear to John. It's something I believe the Apostle Paul, as you'll be hearing tomorrow, really expounded upon. But it is John that used the Greek verb meno, that is remain, 33 times in his gospel and 20 times in his epistle. It's one of the most frequently used verbs he has. On numerous occasions, John heard Jesus talk about, to his disciples, about remaining in me. He thought about it. He interacted with it. It shaped who he was, how he faced difficulties and problems. John carefully reinforces the power and promise of abide with me so that we will not miss this tremendous opportunity to listen to what that means so that we might have life and have it to the full, have it abundantly in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd like to share with you, however, that as you look through history at this particular verse, there are some things about it that people just completely misunderstood. One of them was at the time of Martin Luther. They looked at abiding in Christ as life under Christ. 
there are many that would talk about what was being believed at that point in time, even some Christians, even some Lutherans. Roland Baton, a Luther scholar, talks about this. This is where they thought that remaining in Christ meant remaining under him in terms of it was going to be punishment and blessing, punishment and blessing. And if you did well, blessing. If you didn't, curse or something worse. And so this is what constantly happened. This is the life that people lived. Some of the Christians at Luther's time looked at this abide with me as almost as if it was a, a good dog, bad dog thing. And if he didn't learn to listen again, you would be punished perhaps even severely. But of course, nobody thinks that way today, right? Certainly not among us either. But indeed, there are plenty of Christians who live each day with the belief that they are under the condemnation of the law. Think about it. What happens when a disaster strikes? How about like something that wipes out a town, a hurricane, a terrible plague, or maybe another mass shooting? There are always people that will say, God is punishing them. It's really interesting because the Reformation restored a proper sense of the understanding of what it means to abide in Jesus. It certainly did for Luther. And he would have a longer quote I'm not going to share with you right now, but he talks about how he discovered in the scriptures that God loved us, that we were made completely right with him by grace through faith because of the atoning, redeeming work of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he does add this. It is he that is through faith that is righteous, and that person lives. When I found this in the scriptures, here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through the open gates. There, a totally other face of the entire scripture showed itself. Being in the word of God, letting the Holy Spirit shape us that we might understand what Jesus is saying here. And it's not that you're constantly under judgment. You're not under judgment. Secondly, was life from Christ. There are many other ways that people can misunderstand the words, but this seemed at one time and still at many times is a big one. Some people hear these words, that is, remain in me as an invitation to prosperity. The idea, if you can remember back to the prayer of Jabez, anybody remember that? Pray it enough, pray it often enough. And of course, God has everything in mind for you. He wants to do the very best that he can for you. The heart of that era, of course, is um, we can't manipulate God. I'm thankful that people were praying, but we can't manipulate God. The other thing that perhaps was wrong with this was, does God really want you to be happy? The answer is yes. He wants you to rejoice in him. But one of the clear clearly identifying characteristics of this misunderstanding is that God becomes a magic genie. But God is God, and we are his servants. And that is not to say that God doesn't want to richly bless us. In fact, he says, seek first the kingdom of God, and everything else will be added to you. And he meant it. And we look at what he says here in this text about praying and believing and receiving, and we understand that he is a faithful and loving God. But the second reason that understanding is wrong is God gives us gifts, but he gives us gifts for our good. And many times we want gifts that are not very good. Recently I had the privilege of being in London and I had never walked into a Lamborghini store. Fancy race car, I know you got a lot of them around here, saw one on the way in. Never been in. These were 2019 models. Colors were absolutely gorgeous. For a moment, I was drifting, thinking about driving in this car that I obviously needed and traveling around to all the churches. God, it's for your purpose. I am going to be visiting all of these churches. In fact, a word from the Bible came to mind. Godspeed. Anyway. Anyway. Did I really need that car? No, I did not. I have a great car. It serves me well. I get around, even in the snow, something that you're not too familiar with. But God is faithful. God is faithful. And I am grateful. 
It's just a mistake. The final one, really, is life for Christ. And perhaps this is the most popular distortion of the relationship that is in Jesus, or Jesus wants, people think, when he says, abide with me. This view is based on the assumption that we want to make at least partial repayment for the gifts that God gives us. We're not generally that outspoken about it, but it is a subtle deception. I'm going to demonstrate my love for God by becoming a missionary. I'm going to change my community with the gospel message so that God will be proud of me. I'm going to feed the poor and give 10% of everything I have back to the Lord or care for my neighbor so that God isn't disappointed in me. But while not denying the gift of salvation, this perspective of our relationship with God assumes that God wants some kind of token gesture in repayment. Again, we may not always be thinking this, but you'll gain the clarity I think that God wants us to have. This fruit that God does want will happen, and we'll be talking more about that tomorrow, but it's a fruit that comes from being and remaining in Christ. It is the evidence of the Holy Spirit within us. It is the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of Jesus himself within us. And the more we abide in Christ, we'll find out in, that begins to show itself. But when we talk about life for Christ, this is why it's such a big deal. First, we are doing good things so that God will be proud of us or not angry with us. When we say that, we are saying that Christ's sacrifice really wasn't enough. I love how the Apostle Peter, with complete confidence, writes these words. His divine power has granted to us all things, all things pertaining to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1. Christ's divine power has given us everything, not just some things. Second, and perhaps more importantly, we introduce doubt into our relationship with Jesus when we believe that God's grace somehow demands our good works. When will I have ever done enough? What if I fail at what I want to do for Jesus? What if I want to do something, but it's just not good enough for Jesus? This final deception about what it means to abide with Jesus is perhaps the most popular deception among Lutherans. And it has left a wake of destruction in its path. Church workers and lay leaders, overly zealous to do something great for the Lord, have hurt their marriages, sacrificed their health, and lost their community. One pastor in Michigan reflected, I often found that when I was in danger of burnout, I was working too hard, too long, trying to do that which I believe God would not do or could not do. In short, I was trying to take up God's job. Brothers and sisters in Christ, remember that it is here that Jesus calls us friends. And it is here that Jesus said, to each of us, as he did to his disciples that night, abide in me. When he did so, he was not calling us to live under the threat of God's law, life under Christ. He was not encouraging us to use God as some vending machine, life from Christ. He was not asking us to go out and do great things for God, life for God. When Jesus asked his disciples to abide with him, he was asking them to remain in him. I'm not blowing you away, I know that. But do we believe this? In Christ, please listen, in Christ, we are perfect. In Christ, we have complete forgiveness. In Christ, we find our new identity. In Christ, we find our peace. 
in Christ, there is no more striving, no more worrying about the future, no more guilt, and no more shame. And it is Paul that in Romans chapter 6, it's an incredible chapter on baptism. Verses 1 through 14 are just chocked full of what it means to be in Christ, to remain in Christ. And I hope that we can elaborate on that more. But he makes this statement there. Consider yourselves dead to sin. All these things that would pull you away from Christ. Consider yourself dead to them. Why? Because you died and rose again with Christ. And consider yourself to be alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is God's doing. This is God's good work. This is what it means to be and remain in Jesus Christ. You are a precious child. You have been known from eternity. And as we've already heard, God knows more about you than you know about yourselves. The very number of hairs on your head. He knows how many times that we've said, I'll never commit that sin again, but we have fallen it's happened again, maybe over decades, whatever it might have been. He knew that about you too, and he still loved you. And when Jesus was hanging on Calvary's tree, and when he said to Telestai, it is finished, in his eternal vision, he had seen our first parents, Adam and Eve. He saw the last people that would ever live on this globe, and he saw you here tonight. And there was no sin for which he has not paid. Remain in me, and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. I look forward to sharing with you tomorrow morning. Thank you.